November 22nd, 1969. Game day. The Wolverines were 17 point underdogs at home, taking the field in front of a then record 103,000 fans inside the big house. As kickoff drew near, the emotion built inside Michigan Stadium, fueled by Woody Hayes and the Buckeyes warming up on the wrong side of the field. He went down to the other end and all of a sudden we started to get snowballed by the, by the people in the stands uh, that we were in the wrong end. So we had to go back up to the other end and warm up, but uh, you could tell that it uh, was high, high tensions and high uh, uh, emotions in that football game. It was going to explode when that game started. As Schimbeckler readied to lead the Wolverines out of the tunnel, he issued a challenge that years later remains fresh in his players' minds. He said, in order to win, men, he said, Moorhead, you got to be better than Kern. And Henry Hill, you got to be better than Jim Stillwagon. And Mandich, you got to be better than White. And he, and Ot uh, Garvey Craw, you got to be better than, uh, than Otis. And he went right on down the line. For Michigan, the time was now. Those who had stayed had their chance to be champions. Floated down the tunnel. I mean, your feet did not touch the, the ground. You're running out on that field, and it was uh, an awesome experience. Well, it was like this, you know, like a, an orchestra building up this to this huge crescendo at the end. Win, and Michigan would exact revenge for the humiliating loss in 1968 to throw in the Buckeyes and win a Big Ten championship. For Schimbeckler, the game represented an opportunity to beat his mentor. Teams are lined up, the fans are on their feet. Dana Coyne's kick is coming down around the Buckeye 13-yard line where it's taken by Campana. He picks up a block at the 20, Campana's at the Ohio 25, 30, breaks a tackle at the 35, over the 40. And Ohio State took the opening kickoff and wasted little time, marching downfield with ease, bullying their way to an early first quarter touchdown. Third and goal to go on the one. touchdown for Ohio State. We took the football and we drove it right down the field and we scored. We did our job. And we felt that, okay, we had our confidence. We went down and uh, point, put uh, the big points on the board and uh, we'll wait till we get the ball the next time. The start of the game was a little disheartening in that they took the ball right down the field and scored. A missed extra point was a rare mistake for the Buckeyes enabling Michigan to battle back. Wolverine quarterback Don Moorhead engineered a scoring drive that ended with a Garvey Craw touchdown. The Michigan extra point was good, and the Wolverines took an early lead. With the Buckeye upright, the Wolverines lead 7-6. to six. Michigan has just established themselves as a real threat to this part of Ohio State football machine of 1969. We went, took that ball, and shoved it right down their throats. They get the ball back, they just figure, okay, this is our chance now. I mean, we expected that they were going to score, but we knew they, they weren't going to stop us. And we came right back and scored. Ohio State answered on the next drive. Rex Kern hit Jan White for a touchdown, and Ohio State regained the lead 12-7 after the Buckeyes' two-point conversion attempt failed. Trailing 12-7, Michigan answered again. Accurate passing by Moorhead and another Garvey Craw touchdown gave the Wolverines a 14 to 12 lead. And there you see quite a surprising score, 14 to 12, the Wolverines of Michigan. That built our confidence when our offense could move on them two consecutive times. But when we had, when I had the second time, they had no chance. At that point, they were done, they were beaten, we're on our way. Well, we came back a second time and took the lead. Now all of a sudden they're thinking, this has never happened before. As we did move the ball, that just gave us more confidence, you know? And it, we got even more excited. Schimbeckler's familiarity with Hayes and Ohio State allowed him to craft a game plan that began to frustrate the Buckeyes. He said, we're gonna run the weak side, they're gonna, sl they're gonna slant to the strength, they anchor the end, we got natural hold back, weak side, we're gonna run away from Tatum. And, you know, and then the other thing he said is that they don't know how to come from behind. They've never been behind. 
turn, looks to the sideline. Rifles won, it is almost intercepted. They knew what we were going to do before we knew it. And that was the hard part because we felt, wait, okay, we'll try this particular play and that gets stuffed. Okay, well, let's go back to our basic. They stuffed that. The Wolverines forced an Ohio State punt on the ensuing possession, and Michigan's Barry Pearson would highlight a career day with a return to remember. The 50, goes to the 40. He may break this one. He's got a man blocking for him, cuts to the 10, and is down on the four-yard line. What a run by Barry Pearson of Michigan, a senior from St. Ignace. It's on the three-yard line. You know, I had to jump through a couple guys, avoid the wave, and then I'm on my way. And, and uh, geez, we got, you know, we got most of our blockers left, and they got two or three guys left, and it was, it was beautiful. Pearson's return set up a Don Moorhead touchdown and a 21-12 Wolverine lead over top-ranked Ohio State. You know, wormed my way in one way or another. And so, yeah, we were excited, and I still remember Deardorff coming up to me and, you know, the big hug after that score. Michigan added a Ted Killian field goal before the intermission and took a 24-12 lead into the locker room. When we were up 24-12 at halftime, you see, that's the most dangerous thing that can happen to a big favorite like Ohio State. You can't let the other team go in at halftime thinking that they can win. And we not only went to halftime thinking we could win, we went to halftime knowing that we could win. We try to make adjustments and uh, just get things straightened out because we were, we were in a little bit of disarray. We weren't playing the type of football we, we are normally play. And, and I think that was caused by them, not by us. I mean, I think we were a good football team, but, but they were, they, that day they played exceptionally. Schimbeckler's defensive schemes continued to confound the Buckeyes in the second half, causing the Ohio State offense to lose patience and abandon the run for the pass. Playing right into Michigan and defensive back Barry Pearson's hands. Kern looks, throws a high pass, he was hit. As he threw it, it's intercepted by Michigan. Pearson getting the ball on the 27 yard line. The pass rush was so strong uh, one pass that I had, the quarterback, he had to elevate uh, because they were in his face, so he had to throw it high, and I out-jumped the receiver for it. Barry did everything, you know, he intercepted passes, he ran back the punt that broke our back uh, as well. Uh, again, they were just all over the place. We forced him to throw because they couldn't run. That's the thing, big Jim Otis, and this guy's, you know, no, he's unstoppable. and. Uh, we stopped him. We stopped their triple option. We stopped them because we defended it all year long because we ran it in practice. Ohio State continued to attack through the air, forcing Hayes at one point to pull starting quarterback Rex Kern. Mesajowski fakes short and throws a long one. He's got Kuhn out there and he misses the ball. They couldn't get anything going. They just couldn't get a thing going. You know, they broke a few here and there and scored in the beginning, but we, uh, we had a lot of confidence that day, and it, and it grew play by play by play. It just kept growing. Mitchell looking. Hayden's in the middle. He rifles one. It is intercepted by Pearson of Michigan. A fantastic interception by Barry Pearson. The Buckeyes threatened late in the fourth quarter, only to be thwarted by another interception. And as the clock ticked down, Bo Schimbeckler in Michigan had done the impossible, beating mighty Ohio State and earning a Big Ten championship. Three seconds, two seconds, one second, there's the gun. The ball game is over. The final score again, and Ripley couldn't have written it any better than this. Michigan 24, Ohio State 12. It was crazy. I mean, you know, everybody was hugging one another, and. Uh, jumping up and down. We were talking about the Rose Bowl. Biggest experience, the greatest experience I ever had was those last few seconds on that sideline. Yeah, I, I went down to be on the sideline because it was going to be a, uh, a monumental celebration, one that uh, you could feel building and building. And so it was just nice to be on that sideline and feel the 
the admiration that the kids had for each other. Kids that uh, you're in class with, your fraternity brothers, things like that, were all over the field, jumping all over you and, and trying to tear down goalposts that were 30 feet in concrete. And they did. We're all in a, mass, a sea of, of fans and players um, exiting the field. Um, and somebody's handing out roses, and it's, uh, it's just a very, very special, special day. And Jim Mandich, the Michigan captain, tears of joy streaming down his cheeks. The lasting image from an unforgettable celebration is the Wolverines captain basking in glory. It is wonderful that Jim Mandich is the iconic photo from that game because he was the leader of the team. Uh, he had the character, he had the, the toughness, uh, he had the no-nonsense, very direct, and he complimented Bo very, very well uh, as our captain. And it's very appropriate that he has the iconic picture. So after that game was over, who else would you carry off the field? The captain, the senior, the guy from Ohio who had just vanquished Ohio State.